Hey, good afternoon. I'm Russ Mitchell joining you from the WKYC studios for a special report. The headline is the grand jury has spoken. We are awaiting a news conference from Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost, who we understand will tell us the decision of a special grand jury in the Akron police shooting death of Jalen Walker last June. Now, one of the things in the balance here, the fate of eight police officers who fired at Walker, hitting him 46 with, with 46 shots after a chase by car. Walker then got out of the car, which led to a foot chase. At one point of that chase, Walker fired a gun out of the car he was driving. Let's go to the shot in Columbus right now. We're waiting for the attorney general to speak to reporters and give his opinion. Well, we're, it's a Zoom, so we're waiting just a second for that to pop up. While we wait, let me bring in our legal analyst, Stephanie Haney, who's joining us this afternoon. Uh, Stephanie, let me know here. I may have to cut you off if, if the attorney general starts speaking. But what are the possibilities here? What things could the grand jury decide? Sure. There's a couple different ways this could go, Russ. So what we're looking at here is a possibility of an indictment potentially of all of the eight officers. And in that scenario, what we could see is different charges potentially for each of those officers. We could also see a situation where some officers are indicted and other officers are not. And then we could also see a situation where no one is indicted and this grand jury has determined that there is not probable cause to move forward on this case. For that to happen, less than seven of the nine grand jurors have to say there's just not enough probable cause here. So for an indictment to move forward against any of these officers, seven of the nine grand jurors have to agree, and that's whether that be versus any of them or all eight of them. And no charges filed, the legal definition of that would be no bill, correct? That's correct. All right, let's talk about what a grand jury does. Unlike a jury that you see on television, these folks work in secret. Right? They do. Yeah, they do work in secret. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, because when you're dealing with a grand jury, you're dealing with a different standard of evidence than you are in a criminal trial. So they're seeing evidence potentially that you might not see in a criminal trial. So the things that they see, if they were to be potentially made public, there's a good chance that could taint a potential jury pool. So that's one of the reasons a grand jury operates in secrecy. And it's also, you know, for the protection of those grand jurors as well. Obviously, this is a very controversial case that's been affecting the mm -hmm. city of Akron. So what they do is they operate in secret to determine whether probable cause exists for a criminal charge to move forward to see if this process is going to continue. Gotcha. Okay, we understand the Attorney General is speaking right now. Let's go to Columbus and hear what he has to say. For Summit County just concluded. Um, so we will have a press conference. The AG will share information um, on the results. We also have the two prosecutors who presented the case to grand jury joining us remotely as well. Recording in progress. The AG will do remarks and let the prosecutors speak, and then we'll kick it back to the AG for Q&A. Please let us know if you have any questions in the chat, and we will go through them in the order we've received them. We do have a press release that will be sent out as well afterwards. So at this time, I'm going to let Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost come up and give remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're here to talk about the death of Jalen Walker. My office's work and the decision of the grand jury is driven by the law as it is, not as it might be. The grand jury in this case served as a voice of the community. And my office made a point of neutrally presenting all the evidence to that grand jury. And there was a great deal of evidence presented so that the grand jury could make a, a well-informed decision based on all the facts. While many grand, jurors, grand jury cases take only minutes, this case took more than a week because of the large amount of evidence that was presented. It's important to note at the beginning that the job of our office was to investigate the events at the uh, invitation of the Akron Police Department and then at the invitation of the Summit County Prosecuting Attorney to present that case to the grand jury. The grand jury was instructed about the law by the judge that oversees it not as is customary by the prosecutors, to avoid any question about the accuracy of the legal instructions. Here is a shorthand version of what transpired. In June last year, Mr. Walker took at least 
one shot from his vehicle at the police, led them on a chase, and exited from his vehicle in a ski mask, ignoring multiple commands by officers to show his hands and to stop. As you will hear in more detail from the prosecutors who presented the evidence to the grand jury, a foot pursuit ensued, which officers still having every reason to believe that Mr. Walker was armed, attempted to use non-lethal tasers to subdue him. Mr. Walker then reached for his waistband in what several officers described as a cross-draw motion, planted his foot, and turned toward the officers while raising his hand. Only then did the officers fire, believing Mr. Walker was firing again at them. Although the officers did not know it at the time, Mr. Walker had left his recently purchased gun in his car. Right, that's not However, there is no doubt that he did, in fact, shoot at police officers. Shell oh, okay. casing from that shot was recovered on the entrance ramp to State Route 8, and ballistics traced that back and matched it to the weapon in Mr. Walker's vehicle. The law allows officers to use deadly force to defend themselves or others against a deadly threat. Now, the Summit County Grand Jury, people who live there in the community, spent more than a week reviewing the BCI investigation. The Grand Jury concluded that the officers were legally justified in their use of force. The Grand Jury just a little while ago, issued what is called a no bill, meaning that there will be no state criminal action, no charges at the state level. That does not resolve any potential civil action that might be brought for wrongful death. Now, legal justification does not change the terrible permanent George, are you good to Taylor Walker's death. I grieve the loss of this promising young life, although I recognize that no words of mine can offer much comfort to his family. I do hope they will find some comfort in this. Ohio is unity, unified today in mourning the loss of their son and family member. The body camera footage in this case is especially grievous to watch. Most officer-involved shootings involve an officer or perhaps an officer and a partner. It is unusual, although hardly unprecedented, to have this many officers firing their weapon at the same time at a single subject. The sheer number of shots is one of the things that makes the video so hard to watch. Multiple officers, each making an independent judgment about a threat and acting independently to neutralize that threat, creates a dynamic that amplifies the use of force exponentially. That being said, it is critical to remember that Mr. Walker had fired on the police and that he shot first. There is no more serious matter than when the government takes the life of a citizen. Several years ago, I took the first ever step of publishing our investigative files on every use of deadly force by the police that we investigate. Later today, the files in this case will also be published on our website for everyone to see. I'm proud of the work of our investigators. As you will see, their work was extensive and thorough. The reason I decided to begin publishing all of the evidence that our investigators find was to help each community that has a tragedy like this to understand what actually happened and to know that the investigation was thorough, expert, and independent to know the truth. 
Now, one of our career prosecutors who presented this case to the grand jury will walk you through the evidence in more detail. Anthony Pearson is a career prosecutor with experience in the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office, as well as being a senior uh, assistant attorney general here in our special prosecutions unit. Uh, I dare say that he has handled more of these kinds of cases than anyone in Ohio, and he contributed uh, to the book we published on officer-involved critical incidents. When he is done with more detailed summary, I will return and we both will answer questions to the best of our ability. Thank you. Anthony? Acts of this case, but as also the Attorney General stated, the complete investigation will be up on our website. So obviously, I'm not going to go into all of the details here. But we have the death of Jalen Walker uh, happened on June 27th, 2022. Akron police officers observed a 2005 Buick Century. A license plate light was out on that vehicle. It was around 12:22 a.m. The CAD says. System noted, which is an officer uh, system, tracking system, noted that there was a pursuit of this vehicle the night before. They decided to not conduct a traffic stop at that particular time. Officers return back to North Hayward and Talmadge Avenue. Vehicle returns eight minutes later. At that point in time, the Akron police officers attempted to do a traffic stop. The vehicle flees, fires at least one shot from the vehicle. Pr pursuit ends on Wilbeth Road. A total of 94 shots were fired by eight different Akron police officers. Jalen Walker was shot in excess of 45 times. So a summary of the process, um, interviews and investigations conducted over 100 recorded interviews, including recorded interviews of the eight officers who discharged their weapons, recorded interviews of 47 officers who were involved in the incident at the scene or otherwise deemed to potentially have relevant information. Recorded interviews of possible witnesses, recorded interviews of family members, friends, and associates of Mr. Walker, recorded interviews of other individuals who provided information both relevant and irrelevant to the investigation. Search warrants and subpoenas, uh, investigation subpoenas were obtained and served. A total of six search warrants and four subpoenas related to this investigation included search warrant of Mr. Walker's 2005 Buick registered to him, search warrant of recover his recovered cell phone, search warrant for Uber Eats employment records pertaining to Mr. Walker, search warrant for DoorDash employment records pertaining to Mr. Walker, search warrant for Google records pertaining to Mr. Walker, search warrants for cell phones, and search warrants for financial records and phone records. A scene processing uh, processing of the scene for potential evidence included photographing, searching, documenting, and collecting. 3D scans, models of the uh, incident area, drone footage of the scene, processing of involved vehicles for potential evidence. The BCI agents collected over 150 items of evidence from the scene and vehicle. We all, the BCI agents also collect body worn cameras and dash cameras uh, related to the incident. Eight body worn camera footage clips for the involved officers. Akron Police Department has a policy and procedures where each Akron police officer is equipped with the body worn camera. So not only were we able to get the eight cameras worn by the officers involved in the shooting, we we're also able to obtain the four body-worn camera footage clips from other officers responding after the shooting had occurred. Uh, 38 body-worn camera footage clips from other responding officers. One body-worn camera footage clip and one dash cam camera footage clip from a Cuyahoga Falls officer that captured Jalen, Jalen Walker discharging a firearm from his vehicle. There were additionally 25 Ohio Department of Transportation traffic camera clips, run ring doorbell video clips, six surveillance camera clips for the Bridgestone Center for Research and Technology, ring, Range USA Akron surveillance camera video from June 27, 2022, when Mr. Walker was taken to the gun range there, 
and Range USA Akron surveillance camera footage from June 20th of 2022 that shows Jalen buying the firearm that was recovered from his vehicle after the shooting. A little bit of history on Mr. Walker. He was a 25-year-old male with no criminal history. He worked as a delivery driver for Uber Eats and DoorDash. And prior to that, he worked for Amazon. So directing your attention to June 20th, 2022, we see Mr. Walker at Range USA um, at, at the firing range with a friend of his. He meets this friend uh, that he had known for a long time. They go to the gun range and they meet up and uh, they shoot guns. It is described in detail to the BCI agents afterward during their investigation that Mr. Walker had very little to no familiarity with firearms. And this was essentially his first time firing a, a, a gun. This is the receipt from the transaction that shows Mr. Walker there on June 7th, 2022. Almost two weeks later, um, Mr. Walker is at Range USA. He is there and he purchases a handgun. This is surveillance video that documents his purchase of the handgun. We have the receipt from that transaction that also in included ammunition. And we have his credit card receipt detailing the purchase of that weapon. On June 26, 2022, at 2.30 in the morning, New Franklin Pursuit. Um, that is where Officer Ro Robert Wagner was sitting stationary on Akron Uniforms 4410 Manchester Road. He noticed a vehicle license plate light rear light was out, and that was on a Buick Century 2005 with the accompanying license plate number. He took note of that vehicle, he entered it into the system, and he began to pursue that vehicle. That pursuit uh, became a little bit too dangerous for the, the type of violation that the officer was pursuing. As a result, that pursuit was called off. And this is just a more detailed analysis of where that pursuit began, where it ended. This also uh, identifies where Mr. Walker's home was located at that time. Now, during the pursuit, uh, Mr. Walker's cell phone was at his residence. Cell phone records indicate that, that that cell phone was at his residence. There's no indication that someone else was driving his vehicle. Uh, no text messages, phone calls, witness interviews, or anything like that indicate that someone other than Mr. Walker was driving that vehicle. That driver of that vehicle gets entered into the system as a white male driver. During the interview, obviously, this was something important that the investigators wanted to follow up upon. They, in they interviewed the officer, I'm sorry, the sergeant who uh, entered this information. He was essentially... Um, at the tail end of that pursuit, he saw, he was not behind, I believe he was at the tail end of that pursuit on a side street, and he saw the vehicle, Jalen Walker's vehicle, pass by. And during the interview, he stated, and from what I saw, the guy was wearing a black hoodie. He had his hood up, so really the only thing I could see was his hands. So I assumed, I, I, I didn't assume, I, I thought I saw his hands white, but I could have been the steering wheel because I don't really know. But again, all indications are that that person was uh, Mr. Walker. This is a um, timeline of the pursuit. Um, essentially, the pursuit uh, that night started on, Ju again, June 27th. Uh, Mr. Walker was driving around in the early hours and he is driving around the city and his cell phone is pinging off of various cell phone towers. It doesn't, there's no indication that he is actually going anywhere in particular, but he is just driving in the area. Um, he's driving in the same area where he was pulled over the night before. And this is an interview, I'm sorry, information from Officer Heatwall Officer Heatwall was um, a Cuyahoga Falls 
um, officer. He was stationed at uh, an, an intersection when this pursuit occurred by Akron PD that was initiated because, again, he had a tail light that was out, um, a license plate light that was out, Mr. Walker did. And this officer, Heatwall, saw this pursuit occurring. And he initially followed the vehicles uh, because what he saw was one Akron police officer following this vehicle, and he decided to uh, help out. It is his, his camera that picks up the gunshot. As you can see, Mr. Walker's Buick and the Akron police uh, cruiser following it. Um, it's this officer's dash cam that picks up the best, uh, probably the, the best vantage point to show Mr. Walker firing the round from that vehicle. So going into the pursuit a bit, um, this is when the pursuit started. Um, this is a, just a, essentially a Google Maps uh, outline of the officer pursuit ending at the top of the screen uh, where Mr. Walker's vehicle ultimately stopped. So I'm going to show at this point the shooting in just in real time for one particular officer's uh, body-worn camera. It was one officer who was employed by Akron Police Department at the time. Again, it is 3.53 on this Monday afternoon. Russ Mitchell from the WKYC yeah, studios. You're watching our not, continuing uh, coverage projecting. of the grand jury through, decision uh, in the case of Jalen Walker. Right now, prosecutors are outlining their case, but the headline, as you heard right there from Attorney General uh, we'll Dave Yost, it is a no later. bill. The grand jury has declined to file charges against the eight officers involved in the police shooting death of Jalen Walker last June. We want to go back to this news conference right now. It looks like things have picked up again. This is one of the prosecutors for the state who we're listening to right now. In the chase. So um, Mr. Walker gets on the highway. He fires a shot at the officers. The officers call a signal 21. That is the highest response signal for Akron Police Department. That indicates that something very bad is, is going on uh, and an officer is being shot at. Everyone respond. So everyone who is not all officers who are not immediately involved in something, they need to respond. And that is what happens here. So after the, the shot is fired, they continue to pursue Mr. Walker. And ultimately, this is they end up um, in, in the area where the shooting occurs. But this still here predicts, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it depicts as Mr. Walker's car is, is slot, stopping and slowing down. He is attempting to get out of the driver's side of the vehicle. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell here, but if you look closely, Mr. Walker does have the ski mask on. His eyes are visible. In the next slide, you see a vehicle, and that is a police vehicle um, that has come up on the left-hand side of Mr. Walker's vehicle. And Mr. Walker at this time is attempting to get out of the passenger side. Now, uh, during the pursuit, another cruiser, police cruiser, um, came very close, if not made contact to the driver door as Mr. Walker was looking like he could exit the driver door. So he gets out of the passenger side. Mr. Walker, as you can see again, has a ski mask on. His hands are not visible. Officer shouting multiple commands at him to get out of the vehicle to stop, don't flee, put his hands up. Mr. Walker ignores all of those commands and continues to flee. This is another view, another angle from another officer camera that shows uh, Mr. Walker exiting the vehicle. Again, as the um, Attorney General stated during the introduction, 
officers at this point in time do not know where the gun is. All that they know at, that, at this time of the chase is that they have been shot at. They have followed Mr. Walker. He is bailed out of the vehicle with a ski mask on. They are not aware of whether the gun was is on his person or somewhere else. Um, you can kind of see both hands here, um, but we have to remember that oftentimes cameras pick up things different than what the human eye picks up. Again, another angle from another officer who, who was involved um, shows Mr. Uh, Walker exiting the vehicle and fleeing from them. Mr. Walker continues to run. Um, he is uh, at least on one occasion prior to the shooting, he makes a full 360 turn at the officers. He is, uh, I believe this is part of the turn uh, where he turns, faces the officers as he's running. Throughout this encounter and throughout the chase, they are directing him to show him, show them his hands. To and but Mr. Walker continues to reach for his waistband and possibly into pockets of the garments that he's wearing. These are various videos of Mr. Walker continuing to run and flee from police officers. This uh, slide. Uh, shows that as Mr. Walker was fleeing, more than one officer attempted to use non-lethal force to stop Mr. Walker from fleeing. They used tasers, um, and you can see here the, the yellow item at the top of the screen is a taser. And if you can see there's a, a line through the center, which is the wire that failed to connect to Mr. Walker after the taser was deployed. Again, in this slide, you see officers attempting to tase Mr. Walker. You see a taser on the left hand of, uh, I'm sorry, on the left part of the screen. This is another uh, taser attempt by another officer. Um, you see the, the yellow taser being fired at Mr. Walker as, as he's running. Mr. Walker continues to run. Um, he goes from a running motion uh, where you can see his elbows high as he's running from them. And you can see that here in this slide. So he goes from a running motion to what seems or can be described as a reaching motion. So he goes from running with his elbows high to now reaching either maybe to a jacket pocket or to his pants area, a uh, waistband area which is an indication that multiple that, that law enforcement officers say uh, can be an indication that someone is reaching for a weapon. And here we see Mr. Walker turn. And if you look closely, you can see the outline of Mr. Walker's body. He's turning um, and he's also raising one of his arms. And these two slides depict that as well and show that Mr. Walker is raising his arms. So as Mr. Walker turns, um, at one particular point in time, he raises his arm out. At that point in time, he is shot uh, by responding officers. Uh, the officers um, believed that Mr. Walker was a threat to them. They believed that he was a threat to themselves and other officers. As a result, um, he was shot. And again, this is just various angles of Mr. Walker with his hand out, um, hand, arm extended. And from the lighting conditions, um, it's really, you're really unable to tell whether he had anything in his hand or not. So you can see here that an officer um, has drawn his weapon and he's pointing at Mr. Walker. Again, we see another angle of Mr. Walker with his arm out as uh, shots continue. At this point, we see Mr. Walker has fallen to the ground or is about to fall to the ground. His arm is extended. Uh, one arm is extended up. Another arm is extended down. Various officers indicated in their statements that they heard a gunshot 
and they responded to the gunshot thinking that it was Mr. Walker who was shooting. It was not until later that it was discovered that Mr. Walker did not have a weapon on him. Mr. Walker gets shot, he falls to the ground, and he continues to get shot as he is on the ground. He rolls, but he doesn't stop moving. And we, we, we don't know whether he was moving as a result of being shot and his reaction to being shot or uh, some other reason or whether he was trying to get up. But he was continuing to move and he was to continue and he continued to be shot. Based on the time code calculations, the entire shooting, the time from the first gunshot to the last gunshot was approximately 6.7 seconds to 6.77 seconds. And uh, this indicates the times that Mr. Walker uh, rolled on his hips, rolled on his back, rolled on his stomach, and rolled on his hips and his stomach again. As you can see from this video, there were a lots, lots of shell, casing, shell casings left. There were about, I, I, as I stated before, there were 94 shots fired by, the very, by all of the officers. And this is the scene processing that, that occurred. They were able to recover Mr. Walker's Buick. It slowly rolled into a building. I believe it was an apartment building, but a, <clears throat> not positive, but I believe it was an apartment building. Um, on, his, on, on the seat of that vehicle were the gun, magazine, a uh, wedding ring that Mr. Walker wore, and a shell casing. There was another shell casing recovered from uh, the street from uh, Route 8, South Ramp, from East Talmadge. That's where the officer Hartwell uh, had on his dash cam recover, viewed the sh initial shooting that caused the pursuit in the first place. So there was a shell casing there and also a shell casing inside Mr. Walker's vehicle. Should be noted that the shell casing inside of Mr. Walker's vehicle, the DNA the analysis was done and it came back to Mr. Walker. The DNA, there was no DNA able to be analyzed off of the shell casing that was found on uh, the, the ramp to the highway. But they both matched the being fired from that weapon that was recovered from Mr. Walker's vehicle. And this is, again, a close-up and documentation of the recovery. You can see in the left photo the uh, wedding ring, the shell casing, as well as the DNA laboratory results that, again, will be published for you all to take a look at more closely. Again, that vehicle was, I'm sorry, that firearm was a Glock. It was traced back to the purchase that was made by Mr. Walker on June 20th at that Range USA location. Officers, shots fired by officer. I have uh, written here uh, anywhere between three shots fired by officer four and uh, 18 shots fired by the other officers. Uh, one officer fired six times, one fire officer fired six, teen, one officer fired four, one officer fired 11. Should be noted that even though officers reloaded, no officer reloaded and continued to discharge their weapon. Some officers discharged their weapon until they were empty. They reloaded it. However, they did not continue to fire. Additionally, I want to make clear that... Um, <clears throat> Officers stopped firing. However, Mr. Walker continued to move. But in their interviews, the officers stated that the latter movements they did not see as a threat. However, they continued to shoot until they thought the threat was over. Play a quick animation. Included in your um, 
included in in the information that is going to be released to um, during the that that is released on our website. It will be a, an animation of the officers and their positioning during the shooting. There was an autopsy done, uh, obviously, on Mr. Walker. Um, he was shot 46 times. He had 46 gunshot wounds to his body. Um, that included entrance and in, entrance wounds that the coroner identified. There were no drugs or alcohol in his system. There was um, there was no alcohol or drugs in his system, and he suffered about forty six gunshot wounds. The coroner was not able to tell um, specifically because some of the entrance wounds and exit wounds could be confused with each other. But um, again, he had no alcohol or drugs in his system, and those are the, essentially the facts of the case relating to the death of Mr. Walker. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Anthony. You. We will now attempt to uh, ask answer any questions that you have. Okay. Okay. The first question is from Stephanie Warsmith with the Akron Beacon Journal. Go ahead, Stephanie. Stephanie, can you hear us? Oh yes. I'm sorry. I thought you were going to read it from the chat. <laughs> oh, I can. I figure I give you the option. No, that's okay. My question is whether there was any evidence that this was a suicide by cop incident. I, uh, we don't have any direct evidence, uh, any direct, clear evidence that Mr. Walker had decided that he was going to do a suicide by cop. Um, I, I don't want to speculate as to what Mr. Walker was thinking at the time, but I can say this, that it has been made public that Mr. Walker was going through a very tough time in his life. I think it's been documented that Mr. Walker's fiance had died a short time before this incident happened, and he was going through a very tough time, and he was hurting. And that night that he encountered the police, he was not acting himself. By all accounts, this was a, a good man, a good person um, with no prior criminal record, so he was not acting himself. But other than that, I'm not willing to make a leap as to his intentions on that night. The next question is from Jennifer Kahn with Spectrum News. Uh, yeah, I was kind of um, piggybacking off of, of Stephanie's question. I had been told that his text messages to family and friends did mention suicide. So none of the text records that we will see on your website make mention of that? Well, you will see evidence uh, included in the file from which you might uh, draw conclusions, um, indirect evidence. Having reviewed it, I would hesitate to say conclusively that this was, uh, that that was his motivation. Uh, Anthony, do you want to add anything? I agree. I agree with that, General. Um, there, there is some evidence that is in the file that people may draw their own conclusions based on Google searches and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Doug Livingston with the Akron Beacon Journal. I was wondering um, how we know without a doubt, words were without a doubt that well, Walker was shooting at officers, and not shooting in any other direction. Well, first of all, I am going to take a slight uh, exception, and uh, I don't think anybody said he was shooting in the sense that there was an ongoing process of multiple shots. The officers reported seeing one muzzle flash. There were two casings recovered, one in the car, one out of the car. 
the muzzle flash that was observed occurred at a time when the police were uh, pursuing him uh, for traffic violation. At that point, it was not a high, uh, a high velocity chase. Uh, they were simply, as one officer put it, chirping their siren at him um, at, at that point in time. So, it, you know, what, where was he aiming? Um, it, th there is no conclusive evidence as to that. However, the shell casing uh, was found in the same general location on the entrance ramp to State Route 8 that uh, was reported by the officers uh, as the muzzle shot. Um, I think it's virtually certain that he was shooting the gun at them. He certainly was shooting during uh, the time the police were trying to pull him over. Okay, the next question is from Zachary Ryder with Rubber City Drones. Hi, Mr. Yoso. Zachary Ryder, Rubber City Drones. Are we certain that that bullet casing found on the Route 8 entrance ramp wasn't placed by the police themselves as you mentioned there was dna found on the other parts of the gun and shell casing we know from media standpoint that they had ample time to set this up well certainty is the luxury of theologians uh, we deal with the facts and the evidence that we have um, and certainly no one uh, saw the shell casing fall out of the driver's side window. However, I will point out that the ballistics did match the gun that Jalen Walker had only recently purchased. He was on video purchasing it. Um, his DNA was on it. Um, and I think it would strain credulity to make the assumption that uh, that was somehow planted, not to mention which the logistics of, enable, of allowing that to happen or causing that to happen. Um, I don't even know how you would do that because the CI agents were quickly on the scene. Okay, the next question is from Peggy Gallick with Fox 8 News. Uh, yes, thank you. I, what one piece of evidence, more than any other, led to this decision, do you believe? I'll let Anse, Anthony answer to that, but I don't think you can point to a single uh, piece of evidence. If that were the case, we wouldn't have needed to take more than a week to put everything in front of the grand jury. Thank you, General. As the General stated, uh, yeah, I, I don't believe that there is one piece of evidence that that solves this or shows this or does anything. Um, usually in these types of cases, it's a culmination of evidence. All of the evidence from all the different parts of the investigation that come together. A lot of the evidence that officers and investigators don't know the night of their investigation, but come to light later during their extensive investigation. And I think due to the work of the, of the BCI agents who work their tails off and trying to uncover every rock and every stone to find the, the truth of the matter, um, they were able to pull together a complete full investigation. And I believe that is what the grand jurors considered in making their decision. What do you say to people who don't trust this process and see this decision and conclude, well, that's just the way it always goes? What would you say to them? I would say to them to please go through the evidence themselves. We're putting everything out on the web, and that's the reason we're doing this. There needs to be confidence in the members of the community that this was independently investigated, that it was thorough, that it was expert. And I think if you go through um, the whole file that will be available to you, you will come to the same conclusion. The next question is from Dan DeRoos with Channel 19 in Cleveland. Good afternoon. Thanks for uh, making yourselves available for questions today. I wonder if you could give us the uh, split uh, of the grand jury and their vote uh, in the state of Ohio. Only seven out of nine jurors have to vote in favor of charges. Can you give us what the split was and potentially 
uh, a split of the jury itself, males, females, race? So we're prohibited by law from disclosing the vote. Um, Anthony, do you want to talk about the composition? I actually wasn't in the room. I can't even answer the question. Yes. Yes, I can answer that. Um, there are two black jurors, um, three men and six women. Okay, the next question is from Jess Kirsch with NBC Nightly. Thank you very much all for um, giving us the time here. I just want to clarify a couple of things because I know a few different jurisdiction were me jurisdictions were mentioned. First of all, can you clarify all eight officers who were uh, having evidence against them reviewed? They were all Akron police officers. If you can please confirm that. Also, um, can you confirm if any of the eight police officers in question testified before the grand jury or submitted testimony written? Thank you. Anthony? Yes, they were all Akron police officers um, who were under consideration. Um, I'm not at liberty to tell you what was included into the presentation of the grand jury. Okay, and then just bouncing off of that, and maybe you can't answer this either, but I think you know we hear the number of times shot roughly 46. Obviously, we're talking about eight different officers, but you are looking at multiple officers who fired close to 20 times, according to that slide you just showed us. Was for you as prosecutors was looking at the timeline in which those shots were fired at all a factor by me doing a, a quick stopwatch. It looks like all the gunfire erupted in about a seven second span. Is that the timeline you, you have? And is that something you emphasize when you're looking at this from an investigative standpoint? Yes. Um, uh, the time from the first shot to the, to the last shot was 6.7 seconds. Officers are able to use deadly force only when there is a threat of serious physical harm or deadly force against them. So each and every shot has to be accounted for. Each and every use of deadly force by a police officer has to be accounted for. So it is important and uh, incumbent upon us to match up each reaction by a police officer to the response that they're uh, attempting to, to stop. Okay, the next question is from Doug Livingston with the Akron Beacon Journal. Um, I'm wondering on the capacity of the magazines, do all officers use the same weapon? Um, how many bullets did each of their uh, weapons hold before firing? 17 and one in the chamber, I believe, Anthony. Anybody didn't have the standard Glock? That, that is correct. Uh, that's correct, Attorney General. Um, all of the, of the officers carry, I believe, the same make of gun, but not necessarily the same model of weapon. Some officers have smaller hands and things of that nature, so they may choose a, a smaller type of weapon that they carry. Um, so they, they are different. I don't have the breakdown of how many uh, rounds each officer was able to carry in their magazine. Um, and officers do different things. Um, it was some some officers will chamber around and add another one to their magazine. Some officers won't do that to top off their magazine. So it, it kind of depends on the officers. And I can't I know that answer was given and the BCI agents who did their extensive investigation know that information, but I just don't know it off the top of my head right now. Okay, the next question is from Christina Carrera with Capital B News. Thank you for um, your time. I'm just curious to know the breakdown of the officers and the amount of bullets that were fired. Will we have the identity of those officers so we can figure out if there are previous excessive force accusations against those particular officers? That's a question for the uh, Akron Police Department and police chief. Okay, and the next question is from Scott Knowles with News 5 in Cleveland. I'm just wondering if the AG plans to release the names of the officers who fired in this fire. And if, if not, why not? It's our policy not to name uncharged suspects. I would refer you to the chief of police for any further inquiry as to the identity. 
One more quick one. one. But is there any is indication, there indication that the Akron, Akron officers knew at the time of the pursuit on the 27th, on the 27th about, the incident, about the incident in New Franklin, New Franklin on the 26th? Mr. Pearson, I'm going to let you address that so I don't uh, get the timeline wrong. Uh, thank you. Yes, it's my understanding that uh, some of the officers in the pursuit uh, were able to link when they ran Mr. Walker's license plate. It, it it spit back an answer, I'm sorry, information that that pursuit had occurred the night before. And do you know where in the whole process that occurred? Is it after the vehicle is stopped? Is it during the pursuit? Is it prior to the pursuit? I, it's my understanding that it was fairly early on during the pursuit that they entered that information and got the response that Mr. Uh, Walker's vehicle, the 2005 Buick, was attempted to be pulled over the night before. And, and do you uh, believe that played a role in the continuation of the pursuit? Let, let me answer this because there, there's a, an interesting nuance here that you'll find in the record uh, on the web. The first car that encountered Jalen Walker uh, called it in. The uh, driver's partner was the one that used the mobile display terminal and found a note associated with that. They did not stop Jalen Walker that at that moment. Um, he was there. There were no warrants. Um, there, there was no criminal record, and the note that was attached to that particular uh, message in the. Uh, mobile display terminal said that it had been a white driver. Mr. Pearson referred to that in his summary. They elected to let him go on without stopping him uh, for the equipment violation, the broken taillight and the, and the license plate light that were out. Um, they said that it was not safe for them or Mr. Walker or the general motoring public to stop for a minor infraction on a uh, busy state route like eight. It was only about, as I recall, 10 minutes later or so that they, while still on routine patrol, saw the same car. Mr. Walker was driving through the exact same intersection, which meant that he had had to get off the highway and come back to that same place. That was when the officer's curiosity was piqued. Um, and they decided to investigate further. Uh, so uh, the fact is that, that they did know uh, and elected not to initially not uh, even make the stop for safety. And because the original driver had been said to be a white man uh, and they uh, could clearly see that Mr. Walker uh, was African-American. So that was so that just for clarification. The same, the same officer, officer spots that car that two car different two times, times that time. The New Franklin officer was the previous night, and the Akron officers, the same two officers in that first car, saw him twice uh, in short succession to each other the following night. Okay, the next question is from WOIO News, the quick follow-up. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the follow-up. Um, in the course of the, the grand jury testimony, did any of the eight officers physically testify in front of the jury, uh, or was this previously recorded testimony that was played? Were they ever physically there, or was it just video recorded testimony? As Anthony said, we're not permitted to say who testified, um, so we, we can't answer the question. And the last question of the day will go to Stephanie Warsmith with Akron Beacon Journal. I'm wondering if there is any evidence that Jalen Walker had been involved in any crimes leading up to or before the shooting. We had heard that he might have been a suspect in some burglaries or robberies that occurred not long before this and just wanted to ask about that. Mr. Pearson, do you know anything about this? 
Uh, uh, thank you, General. No, um, there's no indication that Mr. Walker was involved in any sort of nefarious activities before. Thanks, everyone. We will go ahead and send this out. Uh, it will have a link to the files that will be online. And once again, you are watching our continuous coverage of the grand jury's decision in the Jalen Walker case. Once again, the headline is no bill. A Summit County grand jury has declined to charge the eight officers involved in the police shooting death of Jalen Walker last summer. Attorney General Yo Singh there, you heard him saying that the jury decided that the officers were legally justified in their use of force. He also talked about the fact that Walker had fired a gun outside of his car, rather from his car, during the police chase. At the time, th and this became a, a chase on foot, as police say, uh, they were under the impression that perhaps he still had the gun. They said he turned around in what they called a cross-drawn motion. The officers felt threatened, and they fired at him 96 times. They fired at him 96 times in less than seven seconds, hitting him 46 times. We have been telling you all week that uh, Akron has been preparing for this day for the last week when the grand jury began meeting one week ago today. And the city has been boarding up some residents, some some homes, some businesses boarding up, anticipating possible violence. And this did not come out of nowhere. Last summer, there was violence, of course, in Akron when this shooting took place back in June of 2022. So buildings have been boarded up. There are people on alert there right now. We are happy to tell you that nothing is happening right now. There are no protests, peaceful or otherwise. Of course, we're hoping for peaceful protests if there are any protests, but so far, nothing. Mayor Dan Horrigan issued a statement earlier today saying in part, quote, I have an overwhelming amount of faith in the Akron community, and I know we will lean into our partnerships and relationships through the uncertainty of the days ahead. We are already getting reaction from some folks in Akron. This from... Councilwoman Tara Mosley, who, uh, by the way, is running for mayor of Akron. I'm going to read her statement in part. I understand there are people in this city who will not trust that this decision is legitimate. I believe that we have, should have done more to give people faith in the process. This would include more transparency from the government in the immediate wake of Walker's killing. Also, we should not have prematurely boarded up and fortified the city making it look more like a war zone than a place where jurors could peacefully deliberate, consider the evidence, and make a decision. She goes on to say, it is imperative that both police and protesters stay nonviolent. Only then do we give ourselves the best chance to heal our grieving city. Again, that from Tara Mosley, the city councilman, one of the city councilmen from, from Akron. More details coming in as we speak. Once again, no bill in this case. No officers will be fired, will be charged rather, in the police shooting death of Jalen Walker. These officers have been on administrative leave since the shooting last June, paid administrative leave. We don't know what's gonna happen at this point with them. We, we, we wanna tell you what's going on this afternoon. Hopefully we'll have some answers. There are a number of things happening today at 5.30. The city of Akron is set to hold a news conference to explain what they're doing in this case and their reaction to it. And at 6 o'clock, we will hear from attorneys from the family of Jalen Walker. That, again, at 6 o'clock. But uh, at this time, 429 of this Monday afternoon, Stephanie Haney, our legal analyst, has been here with me. She's been watching this along with me. You watch this. What do you make of it? Well, I thought it was very interesting, the transparency that we're getting from Attorney General Dave Yost in this case. And one of the things that I think is significant is we've heard for the first time in the evidence that they say will be published on the Attorney General's website. We heard for the first time they say shot at police because previously there was a indication that shots were fired and there was a big distinction made there. It's an important technical term distinction. So we were hearing that from Attorney General Dave Yost today for the first time, shot at police. You know, in the case of these grand jury proceedings, we often don't get to know what happens if there is a no bill returned, if there is no indictment in these cases. But the Attorney General has said that he's made it a point in his office to put that evidence out on the website. He said it will be available today on the Attorney General's website. And that was something that he told people that he would hope that they would do as they are coming to their own conclusions about what we saw happen here today, mm -hmm. Russ, with this no indictment against these mm -hmm. eight officers. So mm -hmm. that evidence will be available mm -hmm. for everyone to look at. And I think that's really mm -hmm. interesting and something I would encourage people to do. Yeah. And again, going back to these questions of the grand jury, as we spoke earlier, a grand jury is different. It meets in secret. You heard the attorney general and the prosecutor there say, we're not going to give you the names of the grand juries. We're not mm -hmm. going to give you anything about them at all. So in this case, this is something that we probably will 
will not get any insight into what went on in that room. Sure. The only thing that we do know is what one of the prosecutors told us. It's a jury of nine people. Two of those people were black individuals. Three of them were men. Six of them were women. We do know that in this case, in order to have been an indictment, seven of those people would have had to believe that there was probable cause to move forward on this case. The only thing we know for sure is that at least three of them didn't. Right. Because six people could have thought there was probable cause, but they didn't have a seventh. We know that for sure. And, you know, to that point, none of them could have thought that there was probable cause, but we know for sure that at least three of them didn't. Yeah, one of the questions that we heard one of the reporters ask, and this is something that a lot of people are asking right now, quite frankly, what do you say to people who, who say, here we go again, this is what happens all the time, and the Attorney General did address that. He said, please go through the evidence, asking people to go through the evidence themselves. That evidence is going to be put up on the internet for, for everyone to see. And that's fairly unusual, is it, or, or no? That is certainly not required. Now, mm -hmm. the Attorney General has said that this is something his office has made a point of doing, but it's definitely not required. This is above and beyond the legal requirements here in this state. Once again, to give you a timeline of what is going to happen at 5.30 today, the city of Akron will hold the news conference to give its response to the grand jury's decision. And at 6 o'clock, the family of Jalen Walker, uh, probably helmed by their attorney, Bobby DiCello, will speak as well. Let's go back down to that, that shot in downtown Akron that we, we brought you earlier. Once again, downtown Akron, peaceful at this hour. We're happy to hear that. Hopefully it stays that way. It is a rainy, sleeting day uh, in downtown Akron. But we know over the past few days there have been folks out uh, making their their point known, making that uh, their point known, they wanted the grand jury to consider all the evidence in this case. The grand jury has spoken, and now we wait. All right, Emma Sykes, the congresswoman, of course, from Akron, issued a statement just a few minutes ago. I want to read that in part to you. We have seen it too many times. A routine traffic stop ends in death, and a family and community mourn the loss of a son, a brother, a friend, a neighbor, as this country and community reckons with another tragic death, we find ourselves yearning for a justice system that protects us all. That from Congresswoman Emma, Emma, Amelia, Amelia, Amelia Sykes, pardon me, pardon me, Amelia Sykes from, from Akron, who also called for peace in Akron as we go through this afternoon. Again, Russ Mitchell along with Stephanie Haney here in the WKYC studios. We are bringing you coverage of the grand jury decision in the case of Jalen Walker. Grand jury decided this afternoon no bill. It has declined to, find, to file any charges against the eight officers involved in the police shooting death of Jalen Walker last summer. Stephanie, let me bring you back in here for just a second. So as we await to hear what the city has to say and, and what the family has to say, one thing that we heard the attorney general say in the news conference is this means the state is not filing any charges. He did open the door to civil charges, obviously, if the family wanted to do that. And he did not say this, but there are other ways to go here if someone wanted to go that route. Sure, absolutely. So several different things could happen from this point. We do know that the Akron Police Department was very adamant about saying they were not involved in this criminal investigation, but the Akron Police Department was doing its own internal investigation. We don't know exactly where that investigation lies at this moment. So now we'll see a scenario where the Akron Police will be looking into, as they already have been, potential policy violations that these officers may have committed. We don't know what will come there. And then also, we have learned from the attorney for the family, Bobby Pacello, that the Walker family does plan to pursue a wrongful death lawsuit mm -hmm. against the city. So we can expect that. I'm sure we'll help more of that when we hear from Mr. Ducello and the Walker family. Yeah, one of the questions also to Attorney General Dave Yost, will you, you give us the names of these officers? So the reporter posed this question so we can see if there was anything in their background uh, that may come into play here. He said that was something for the Akron Police Department uh, to, to deal with, and perhaps the Akron Police Department will address that later. But again, in, in these cases, again, this, this is as the attorney general said, this is a case by case basis. There is no this blanket blanket rule for that. No, that's something that the Akron police will have to determine whether or not. Now, what he said was the state of Ohio, the attorney general's office, they don't release the names of suspects who aren't charged. So it will be, you know, up to the Akron police department how they want to proceed in that matter, if we'll ever know the names of these individuals. Mm, yeah, uh, that is something. And we talked about while we were watching this news conference, because uh, the question will come up. Uh, that one of the reporters did ask there, what does this mean? You, some will say, here we go again. One thing you pointed out in, in, in these cases, and we see this many times, is you cannot really get into a state of mind of anybody in a totally accurate way. Sure, and you know, as the Attorney General said when he was speaking, 
they deal with the law as it is, not with the law as it should be. And the law in the state of Ohio is that officers are allowed to use deadly force if there is a threat of serious bodily injury or a deadly threat. Now, what constitutes serious bodily injury or a deadly threat? That is something that there is no objective standard to. That's something that's very difficult to get inside the mindset of a person who's experiencing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Once again, when I, I know people are just tuning in. You're expecting to see uh, what's now at uh, four o'clock. You're, you're watching us. So I'm going to tell you every few minutes why we are on, on the air right now. We are here with our continuous coverage of the grand jury decision in the police shooting death of Jalen Walker. Grand jury has decided that no charge will be filed in this case. Once again, Attorney General Dave Yost gave a news conference. It lasted about an hour. Uh, started at 3.30, ended almost uh, 4.30, about seven or eight minutes ago. And what was interesting about this is a lot of times we, we hear these news conferences and, and we, or we get a statement you know, saying this is what the grand jury decided. The fact that the, that the attorney general and one or two of his prosecutors, I couldn't tell if there was one or two people we were listening to and the prosecutors, took almost an hour to break this down, I thought was interesting. It certainly was. And again, that is something that was absolutely not required. The attorney general's office really going above and beyond here to present all this evidence. And apparently we will see more, as they said, there's more evidence that we'll be seeing. He had said that everything that was presented to the grand jury is what will be posted on the attorney Attorney General's website. They went into some of the things that they looked at, the Google search history of Jalen Walker, phone records of Jalen Walker, employment history records of Jalen Walker, you know, uh, statements from the officers, certainly. So we'll be available for everyone, not only us here in mm. the news industry, but also everybody at home can take a look at that for themselves and, you know, come to their own conclusions. Yeah, I'm not asking you to, 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 to speculate here, but I, I guess I am <laughs> in many ways. We're going to hear from the city of Akron at 530. Their attorneys have obviously gone through this and they've crafted what to say. If you're the city of Akron, other than what we're hearing from other folks, calling for calm, calling for people to be, if you're going to protest, please be peaceful about it. What are you going to hear from the I city of Akron from a legal standpoint? I think that we'll continue to hear from the city of Akron, you know, uh, some of the things that we heard from Attorney General Dave Yost and from the prosecutor who was talking about this case. Comments about Jalen Walker as an individual. We know that he he didn't have some long-standing criminal record. I think we'll hear more about him as a person. I think we'll see, you know, uh, a deference to the family, to the Walker family, and just a reminder that these are people and this is a family that's impacted by this, you know, regardless of what we saw from the grand jury today. And I think that they will, uh, they'll be a little bit probably careful with their wording because again, we do know that a wrongful death lawsuit is coming against the city of Akron, but I think that they will show deference to the family. That's what I'm expecting to see today. Hmm. Let's go back to downtown Akron if we could. Is, is, is this Kara ready? Is our reporter there ready to tell us what's going on, Meg? Can you kind of Give me a heads up on that. Okay, I presume she is not. So again, we're going back to that shot there of a quiet downtown Akron. Now, when these news conferences happen later today, one thing that's interesting about them, they will take place in, in different spots than they took place last summer. One is, is taking place slightly uh, outside the city. Another will take place in another location. And, and that is, is by design, as you see at Devon, our photographer there in the middle of that shot, just kind of looking around. But again, that goes on at 5.30 this afternoon. That's when the city of Akron will speak. And Bobby DiCello, the attorney for the family of Jalen Walker, will speak at 6 o'clock. The family has been, uh, you know, as, as Stephanie pointed out, through the attorney, has said it will file a wrongful death lawsuit in this case. We'll probably hear about more of that at 6 o'clock tonight. So once again, as we wrap up here, and I toss it to my partners, once again, the grand jury has decided in the case of Jalen Walker, no charges will be filed against the eight police officers involved in the case. Dave Yost, the attorney general, is saying the grand jury decided that those officers were legally justified in their use of force. So at 440, our coverage continues now. Here's Jay and Betsy with What's New. All right. Thank you so much, Russ, uh, for keeping us updated on that. Of course, we've been watching along.